Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you so much for watching. So about a year or so ago, I purchased a laser engraver to upscale the work that we do here in the garage and to offer it for the products that we have on our Etsy store. So if you didn't know, we do have an Etsy store and we sell the things we make here in the garage. So if you're interested in that, I will leave a link down below. Well, recently the folks at Adam Stack reached out and asked me if I wanted to evaluate one of their lasers. And of course I said yes. And so here it is. I have assembled it. I've run a variety of tests on this machine and really ran it through its paces. So what I would like to do is run through the specifications really quickly, jump over to the quick build montage, talk about some of the process there. And then I will run you through the results of the testing that I did across a wide range of materials that I use here in the garage. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into the specifications. So they sent me the Atom Stack A10 50 watt laser, which has a 10 watt optical output at the 445 nanometer range, which is typical for diode lasers like this. It has a 410 by 400 millimeter cut and or engraving area here. It's got the controller on the front and it is belt driven. It does have one motor for the Y gantry and one motor for the X gantry. Again, that's fairly typical for for laser engravers in this class. It comes with an external power brick here. It does not have it integrated in, which I think is actually probably a good thing. If something were to happen, then you can replace this independently from a power supply per se. Some of the other features of this specific machine, it has the controls on top here with an emergency stop switch, which could be really important. It does have a reset button and a power button as well, and a slot for the micro SD card right here on top. It has a controller here with a touch screen, and what this allows you to do is upload a G-code onto the SD card and then control your laser engraving or your laser cutting using this controller. So that means that it does not have to be tethered to a computer at all times, which is a little bit of a differentiator, I think, for a machine in this class. I don't know that I've seen any other machines with the controller that allows the machine to be controlled uh, autonomously without a computer at this price point. So I think that is definitely something interesting and worth investigating for this machine. Atom Stack also provides all the tools you need to assemble the machine and all the hardware, obviously, as well as this flash screen, which protects your work service, which I think is really cool. It's just a piece of, I think, tin or something like that, uh, but you can lay it down on your work surface and that protects anything you're cutting on. Should the laser be on, it won't uh, harm the surface that it's cutting on. And that is, again, a little bit of a differentiator. None of the other machines that I've investigated so far uh, provide one of these, which I think is a really great idea. Now that we've covered the specification of the machines, I'm gonna jump into a quick build montage, show you how easy it was to put together. It took me about an hour from the point where I was unboxing it until I was actually laser engraving and cutting with this machine, which is really cool. It's not quite as easy to assemble as something like the Onefinity CNC, for example, but it is significantly easier to assemble than the Ortor laser, which I got last year. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the build montage and then we'll switch over and we'll talk about some of the results I got with the testing that I've done. All right, so you can see from that montage that it is certainly easy to put together. There's only a handful of screws and a couple bolts and you're good to go. One thing that I would like to say about the building process is it was very easy to do. However, the instructions on attaching the belts wasn't as clear as maybe I think it could have been. I did figure it out. It's not hard necessarily, but for someone who's never done this, I think it might be a little confusing. So that's one thing maybe I would recommend they do is just really update their manual and provide a little bit more clear instructions on some of the installation steps and procedures. All right, so switching gears here, let's talk about some of the results 
results I got. So the very first test that I ran is actually a file that I had configured for the Ortor laser. I was making some uh, butterboards here in the in the garage, and if you haven't seen these butterboards, they're all the rage on the TikTok right now. So. But this specific butter board needed to have some letters engraved into it, so I had done that with the Ortor laser. And so I thought, let's go ahead and just try that file with this machine, even though it, it has twice the power as the Ortor. Let's see what the results were. And the results were fairly interesting as far as I'm concerned. So here is the piece that I did the test cut on. On the bottom here, we have the cut that I did with the Ortor to dial in the settings here. And then on the top, I actually have what we did here with the Atom Stack. And what is interesting is uh, the Atom Stack actually generated a lot more charring than the Ortor, which is sort of expected. I did not have any sort of air assist or a fan running while I was doing the cutting, and I did not adjust the power level, so it was ostensibly cutting just a little bit higher power. But uh, the cut that it created was actually just, it was more brown than the Ortor. The Ortor created a very dark, sort of almost black charcoal-y color, and the Atom Stack created something that was more brown, more of a toasted color. <laughs> so I actually like the results of the Atom Stack just a little bit better, and it actually seems to be a little bit more crisp. So I will have to dig into the specifications a little bit further and see what the dot size is to see if maybe it has just a slightly smaller dot. So from there, I pivoted over to using this power scale. So I found this really interesting website that you can create these custom scales for your machine. You can set the power levels and the min and the max power, the min and the max speed, and some other things like that. So it's really cool. So the first one I did here was from 30% power to 100% power, and from 100 millimeters per minute all the way up to 7,600 millimeters per minute. And I got some very interesting results, which were, I would say, fairly predictable at the slowest speed as the power increased obviously there was more and more cutting and more and more charring as you can see here from the top and as we went further down and we got faster with less power it was less visible the engraving was less visible there is a little bit of artifacting on some of these uh, engraves which is really weird I thought maybe the speed was just too high and that's what was causing this waviness in some of the patterns but there was one instance here in the middle where uh, the the cut at uh, 550 100 millimeters per minute was perfectly fine but the one before that at 4,600 and the one after that at 5,600 was uh, that had some artifacts in it and that was really weird. So I don't know if something's loose here or if maybe there's some resonance or ringing on the machine itself. But at the relatively slower cut speeds, it worked perfectly fine. So I'm happy with the results here and it has given me some metric to start with some of the other testing that I did. So from there, I pivoted over from the regular engraving to the full sort of fill here. I did change the settings a little bit to go from that 30% power to 100% power as well, but I changed where it started and it stopped in terms of the speeds. And I actually ended the cut early because it was, <laughs> it was generating a lot of smoke and a lot of charring on the machine and certainly going slower was only gonna generate even more. So I got what I needed to know out of this, which is for this Baltic birch plywood, some good settings are here, right here in the middle. If you're gonna look for a lot of engraving and you want nice deep cuts with crisp corners, not a lot of charring and a pretty good coloration. And so, and if you, if you wanted something even light, you can go all the way down to the bottom here. So I will uh, post the files that I used as a link down below if you wanna check those out, if you have a machine like this or something similar that you wanna run through. Next, I pivoted into testing on materials that I use here in the garage all the time, the things that I am most likely to be cutting and or engraving. And so I started with some soft maple. This is curly maple here. So I started with a 30% power setting at 4,000 millimeters per minute and worked my way up to 40% power 50% power and 75% power. So as I worked up, obviously the engraving got deeper and it got more dark. And as I got to the 75% power, I actually got a lot of charring. And so I did turn on a fan to kind of blow some of the smoke away. I do not have air assist on this machine. It does not come with it and I haven't modified it yet to add it. So I got some pretty decent results here. I'm really happy with them. Certainly at the 40 and the 50% power, it, it produced really great results.
And so from the soft maple, I pivoted into some hard maple. Now from a material perspective, hard maple and soft maple, despite the name, they're pretty close in their density on a Janka hardness perspective. And so the results were pretty similar. Now I did change the settings a little bit. So I increased the speed for the 75% power to see if I could reduce some of that charring. So I increased the speed to uh, 4,500 millimeters per minute. There was still charring, a little too much charring that was from an acceptable perspective, but the results around the uh, 30, 40, and 50% power were consistent with the maple, which is good news, so you don't have to necessarily modify your settings based off these two materials. So from there, I grabbed a piece of sapile. Now, sapile is otherwise known as African mahogany. It is uh, similar in terms of its density and its jank and hardness as maple. I think it's a little bit more hard, but it's got a slightly more open grain pattern than maple, and it does finish really, really well. I got some really compelling and interesting results here, I will tell you. So I, I did the same 30, 40, 50, 75% power tests. I did increase the 75% power up to 5,000 millimeters per minute to decrease that charring and it seemed to work here. What is interesting here because this material is brown you can't actually see any charring at all really and all of the colors are very consistent. It doesn't kind of have that gradation that we saw with the uh, maple and so that's interesting to me. I don't know what I expected but I guess maybe that is the way that it's supposed to work here with this darker color but I really am happy with the results I got in the Sapili here. They're really compelling uh, and the good news is these same power levels that will work for maple appear to work with Sapele. Now, next I moved on to some walnut. This is just traditional black walnut here. And I ran the exactly same tests that I did on this Sapele. So the 30, 40, and 50, 75% power at 4,000 millimeters per minute for the first three and then 5,000 for the last one. And what is interesting here, again, the colors were about the same as the Sapele. However, I got significantly more charring at the 50 and 75% power levels than I got in any of the other previous cuts. And I don't know if that is because of this specific walnut piece. It, maybe it's a little bit less dense than some of the others. But walnut does have a slightly more open grain pattern, certainly more than maple and sapili, even though it is harder from a Janka perspective than maple. So I'm not really sure what was going on there, but at the 40% power level across all of these, I got really, really great results. So I think at 4,000 millimeters per minute and a 40% power level, that that would allow me to engrave any cutting board or any material that might be mixed in species of wood and get really great results across all the different woods that are in the product. So the last test that I did is actually on cedar. Now I've been making some of the Halloween lanterns out of cedar and I was just curious how the engraving would go on cedar because it is an exceptionally soft wood. You can dent it very easily just by pushing it with your fingernail. You can make a fairly decent mark in it. And I got some really, really interesting results which I was not expecting. And so with uh, cedar here, you can see these lines here. These are some of the growth rings in the cedar. So in between the rings it is very very soft and the rings themselves are fairly hard and so I got some really deep cuts with the same settings that I used on the walnut and that is because this wood is actually less dense and less hard than all the rest of them and what is more interesting though is I got a lot of charring across all the power levels uh, pretty much from the 40 50 and 75 were got some significant charring there but the rings here as they cut across the material they're basically the machine was not removing any of that material it was cutting the softer material more easily so you ended up in this one specifically here in the bottom there's actually a line that goes all the way through it of material that hasn't been properly engraved and so I really don't know how to combat that because if you increase the power level or if you slow it down then it's going to either increase the charring or burn away more of the softer material and leave that harder material behind so I would say maybe cedar is not great for carving However, I think the, the artifact that it created with that line in the middle is actually kind of interesting. And so maybe some people might like that. But this the, again, these results were fairly interesting and I did not necessarily expect them. But the good news is across all the traditional materials that I use in a lot of the woodworking we do here in the garage, uh, things went well and the machine performed superbly. 
to wrap up this video, I just want to quickly run through some of the things that I like about this machine and some of the things that maybe I wish they could change or do a little bit differently. So uh, right off the bat, what I really like is this autonomous controller here. You put your G-code on the machine, you let it run. It doesn't have to be tied to your computer. You can move on to other things. Again, I think this is a discriminator in this class of lasers. Uh, I will have to go back and look at some of the specs of the newer machines that have come online in the last year to see if there are other machines at this price point with this controller. I don't think there are. And so I think that's really awesome. And that is definitely a serious positive for this Atom Stack laser. The next thing I'd just like to note here is having those on-screen controls. Again, you can control the machine with this touch screen, so that's really cool too. Even if you're not using the controller to control the machine, you can still do some movements here without having the machine turned on or tethered to your computer. So clearly having the 10 watt over the 5 watt on the Ortor is definitely a, a step up in cutting power. Now right now on the market, the most powerful laser that you can get from a diode perspective is a 20 watt laser, but that's really, really expensive still today. It's about uh, twice as expensive or almost two and a half times as expensive as this laser. So if you're looking for a good middle ground of something that can really cut and engrave materials, I think this 10 watt laser is a great value in terms of its power output as well as its configuration and its size. So definitely, uh, definitely think that the 10 watt laser is a pro in this category. So I've already mentioned the next sort of pro and that's the inclusion of this flash screen here. Uh, none of the other lasers that I checked out or even the ones that I've purchased have anything like this. Now obviously the big laser that I got, that K40 laser from Monport, does have a metal bottom uh, so it does sort of have have that flash screen built in. Uh, but with that, uh, with the Monport laser, I would definitely recommend some sort of honeycomb or something like that. And you can definitely put a honeycomb on this as well by raising up this a little bit and sliding it under or just adjusting the height of the laser. Which leads me to the next point that I like about this is it does have this adjustable laser head here. And that allows you to uh, put diff materials of different thicknesses here to cut and engrave, adjust the height of the laser. And as long as it is not higher than the height of the laser in the gantry here, you can cut those materials. And so for things like very thick cutting boards or chopping boards, all I have to do is raise up the laser, do the engraving, and we are good to go. Unlike the Monport laser, which has a fixed focal point, so you kind of have to drop the bottom out of the machine to get anything that is more thick into the material and get that cut. Now on to some of the things I wish that they would change. So first, right off the bat, the instructions need a little bit of work. The pictures they have in the instructions are not very clear at all. It's not clear what angle they're taking the pictures from. And and the way in which they try to describe the wiring and the cable management is really, really just needs some beefing up. It's not a huge deal. You can figure it out. But for someone who's not done this before, it might be really confusing, especially with the belts that I mentioned earlier on how to assemble it. The other thing that I wish they would change is these uh, connection ports here are on top. They actually get in the way of the screen. They get in the way of the e-stop button. So if you want to stop this machine for some reason very quickly, your cables might be in the way. It would be really awesome if they were to take these cables and stick them on the side to free up access to the reset button, the power button, and the e-stop on the top. It's not a huge deal. It's certainly not a showstopper, but you can see here that I got a lot of cables going on here in front. And so getting access to the screen here could be kind of challenging with the USB cable dangling here and the power cable. So it's just something that I think maybe they should consider for future machines. The next thing that I want to mention is around the laser module itself. So it has a built-in fan and that fan is loud. It is really loud. The first time I turned it on I thought this thing was going to take off and fly across the garage. So it would be really lovely if that fan wasn't quite as loud. I don't know if that fan is cooling the laser module or if that fan is intended to be some sort of air assist. Nevertheless, it just it makes a lot of racket. And so if you're in here and you're using it, just be advised that uh, know that that fan is going to be running the entire time the machine is on. It does not just turn on when the laser is being used. It is running all the time when the machine is on. And so that's another thing maybe I think that they could fix that the fan only comes on when it needs to. So if it is being used for air assist, certainly only while it's cutting or while the laser is in use, if it's being used to cool the laser module, then it should maybe only run whenever it gets up to a certain temperature, for example. So uh, that's just something that's annoying uh, that you really can't really do anything about as far as I know. So I'd like to see that changed as well. Which leads me to the next point on the laser module. So this knob that uses 
is used for adjusting. Uh, it's really convenient. I like the fact that it's a knob and not the little thing on the side like the Ortor. But what I've noticed is I'm tightening the knob. It has a tendency to grab on this bracket in the back and pull the entire module down, which pushes the module down into the focusing pad, which makes the focusing pad difficult to remove and actually I think is making the laser lower than it should be. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually put a little uh, plastic ring on the back of that screw so that it doesn't dig into the aluminum or maybe align the aluminum with something so that it's not pulling on this. It should be a relatively easy fix and if I do do that, maybe I'll post it on Instagram and show people or whatever. But yeah, this knob just, I think just needs to be smoothed off on the back so it doesn't grab on that aluminum and it'll fix the problem. But uh, like I said, I do like the fact that it's a knob instead of the little thing on the side, but still think that focusing could be a little bit easier and a little bit um, more streamlined if the knob wasn't pulling on the machine like that. Well, that was my review of the Atomstack A10 Pro Laser. I think this module is a tremendous value. It has features that you simply will not find in any other laser in this category. And so it is just a great value for the price that you pay. I highly recommend it. And if you do want to purchase one, I will leave a link down below that will take you straight to the store and you'll be able to pick yourself up one. If you're interested in other laser modules, and I recommend you check out this video right here. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for getting this far. And don't forget to be inspired.